So now we're moving on to some poetry and we're moving out to the Boston area as I introduce Harris Gardner. Harris uh, was the co-founder with Doug Holder of Breaking Bagels with Bards, uh, which I have had the pleasure um, to experience uh, on one occasion, uh, and uh, it happens out in Boston uh, with a weekly poetry community of um, talking about poetry over bagels. He is the co-founder of Tapestry of Voices with Lainey Seneschal. And I believe uh, Tapestry of Voices was very busy last weekend for National Poetry Month with the Boston Festival of Poetry over at the Boston Library with a great big lineup there of many talented local poets. He is the host of two poetry venues, co-founder with Lainey Seneschal. And he's a poet in residence at Endicott College, nominated for the Pushcart Prize with his own poetry, he is one of two poetry editors for Ibbotson Street, and he does so much work for community, as you can hear from the listing of all of these Boston area events. Uh, and Harris is also a talented writer, and he has had his poetry published in a number of publications and journals. A few include the Harvard Review, Midstream, Cool Plums, Rosebud, Fulcrum, and he has three collections of poetry as well, and I believe that there are some on the table this morning. And I have a wonderful quote of tribute to Harris as well. Harris Gardner is the rare breed of poet who promotes others often with more effort than he does for himself. But make no mistake, Gardner is a well-oiled craftsman of the poem as well and is totally married to his art. He has started and seen to fruition more poetry venues than any person I have ever known and has not become jaded or mean-spirited from the experience. Amen. <laughs> he has helped me start the literary group, oh, now you're going to know who it is, the Bagel Bards. And he is an editor of the Ibbotson Street Press, and he has been a dedicated and loyal friend. Enjoy Harris and his poetry for its humor, its artistry, and its humanity. And that's Doug Holder. So please, with uh, that wonderful introduction from Doug, help me welcome up here, Harris Gardner. Thank you, Cheryl. And uh, it's really an honor to be here and wake up and smell the poetry. Since it is uh, National Poetry Month, I'll start uh, with a poem about a poem. Oh, thank you so much. This uh, poem is called Poem likes margaritas. This poem's voice is hoarse from too many words, a rant. Now it can't project beyond a murmur, so it pours a mango margarita, weaves temperate steps along a path littered with weary words on unbalanced feet. Wavy images blur the poor poem's focus. Too bad he thinks, still sober, he awakens the jets on the gas stove to bring lines to a steady simmer. Then all bubbling beads ladder to the surface where they linger while a simile's glimmer will swim or succumb. Right now they are neutral, almost mute. Time, the poem mutters, for another margarita. Sip, swirl, swallow, soon asleep. He dreams a sonnet complete to the last measured beat. The sun parches, the poem stirs. Last dribble of drink teases his throat. He settles with a sated sigh, shapes into 14 lines of music, smooth, sculpted, neat. Um, this one is from a forthcoming full manuscript. No, forthcoming is misleading. It's uh, almost ready. Uh, this one is called A Chip Off the Old Tooth. <laughs> Beyond the mirror I see life and the rainbow's end. In the looking glass I view an omen, a chipped tooth. The ageless one mocks with a dentureless grin 
bit by bit I disappear. Where is this going? To the dentist, I hope. Death teaches us our first steps shortly after the finite trip to birth. Who is the accountant of my worth when the cuckoo sings out 24 hours? What will sustain the wilting flowers? Behind which door is the landscape of my fate? Perhaps 24 years will finish my story with time to revise and smooth the wrinkles. This one is called A Phony Poem. And <clears throat> you'll probably understand the pun. Out of town, out of state, out of my mind, unfettered in space, walls a tight squeeze, a cool breeze blows past as I bounce among stars. Trampolines and boomerangs, wayward thoughts stampede, words in need seek a pen. This is a record of a recording of a recording of my voice. Please feel free to leave a message or not. I haven't got a wisp of a clue when I'll get back to you. <laughs> okay, what I want to do is uh, do a simple poem from Among Us, which is published by Savina Baba Press. And I'm going to, the title poem is very short. It's called Among Us. The breeze stretches pliant forms, kinetic art, breaststroke clouds. There, profiles in near bar relief. Here, a giant in repose. And there, so close, you can almost reach up to pluck a feather, a perfect pair of sculpted wings, a flaming figure in the middle, an archangel over Boston. Senses soar toward the sun when rays sear, sear through languid clouds, revealing noble haloed heads. Perhaps when we look for them, we can see angels everywhere. Be careful who you tell. Um, and this one is from Lest They Become, uh, published by Ibison Street Press. And this is called uh, I'm a Jew, and it's for Daniel Pearl, the journalist who was assassinated by the uh, Taliban. The God of Abraham m must have been only half awake to light the fire of another martyred star. On the video, he said, I am a Jew. God of the wilderness, where are you? Jeremiah may have led the tribal remnants to the unsullied Emerald Isle. Perhaps the native souls on these usurped shores were heirs of the diaspora. The pipes, the pipes of Pan are calling, uproot the panic and pandemonium. Countless swirling torches copper the midnight sky. They bear witness to the war that scorches old cities and virgin trees. Shout alarms to the biblical God who slumbers. All is well with creation only in your dreams. Share the feathered pipes of peace. Images of hope float in the smoke. Will they become mourned ashes on the wind? Okay, changing the tone a little bit. This is called Bombs Away. Say kisses a bomb the wobbly world. Masses dance in the falling, fallout of falling petals. Nuclear warheads have a falling out. Can't agree on a plan to counterattack. The unfurl a white flag that boasts a pair of pursed lips. Uncoupled missiles touch head to head. They lack the power of a deluge of flowers. Throngs crown the silos with wreaths and roses. The bombs stand mute in disarray. Their pink slips are en route to the ticker tape parade. The blast of one billion blossoms diffuses brute strength. Touch its tops, tangles in streets creative ways to compete. My smooches are softer than yours, some say. Our sugar is sweeter, others reply. Saccharine songs muscle along. Just one tender, 
so much bliss, molasses oozing grip, interlocking linguae intoxicate, corks cannonade, frothy bubbles flood avenues, wine stained mouths march to rapturous hymns. All we are saying is give love a chance. A sudden roar and all eyes leap skyward. Fleets of missiles flout their escape from an unfamiliar earth. We're going to the moon, they shout. Luna is for lovers, voices trumpet. Not when we get there, the grim bombs sneer. A new mantle of fear. Okay, two last poems. This one is called um, Lost and Found at the Checkout Counter. It is time to search for lost common sense. Look, the sheep have gathered at the cliff's verge. They are deep in their Baba debate. Whether to take a fateful leap across the chasm to the next elusive mountain peak. The frenzied leaders decide to give it a glorious fly, a rush, a high. The rocks below organize rows of orderly lamb chops. Those that hold back stop, then wisely retreat. No wish to repeat such acts that bleat regret and sorrow. Signs of intelligent life begin to emerge. And my last one, changing the tone completely, because it's not, it is spring, but doesn't quite feel that way, but still a, a short spring poem is called First Seen in the Garden, S-E-N-E. -E -E. Facets of dew sparkle and petals barely awake in pre-dawn gardens. A flirtatious breeze teases blossoms. It reaches deep into the heart of flowers, lifts out pollen and spreads it over beds that bob in delight. River of light flows as the sun crashes through night's arcane curtain. The loop inspects the rose. Diamonds reflect deposited gold. The sun blesses round bowed heads wants nothing more than to repose in beckoning green arms. Thank you. Citizen Spike, in lovely Massachusetts, the birthplace of the nation, folks try to avoid jury duty with the craziest explanations. So, when a jury summons came in the mail for Mr. Spike Califat, Spike's mistress phoned the district court to say that Spike was her pet cat. The court officer laughed loudly and said he had heard that one before. He said Spike had better be in court even if he was at death's door. Mrs. Califat drove Spike to court after feeding him and brushing his coat. Where Spike was chosen for a jury and missed being foreman by one vote. The other jurors loved Spike, saying he was a cool cat. He even passed muster with the judge, who was too bleary-eyed to smell a rat. Luckily, the jury heard easy cases, while Spike purred occasionally. The day's work was soon over, as Spike fulfilled his civic duty. For his work as a juror, Spike received a certificate, which his mistress hung on a wall, just above his kittles and bits. So, if a jury, if a call to jury duty puts you in a snit, just think, if Spike could do it, why should you throw a hissy fit? <laughs> Thank you very much.
It's deep in my memory Is a world that's no longer there Filled with black and white TV And Tipperillo smoke in the air My dad would get home from work Every evening around 7 o'clock I'd be standing by the window Waiting for him to turn on to our block Then he'd pull up to our house Just past the traffic light at 2nd and Main And he'd give me a wave from the end of the drive In our Chevy Biscayne The bottom of the Chevrolet line The first new car that he ever bought But to him it was as fine as any Cadillac on the Laos On Saturdays he'd wake me up at seven and we'd head into town At the barber shop he'd show me off to everybody hanging around Then he'd take me for a burger at this joint just off the county two lane And when we got home I'd help him polish the chrome on our Chevy Biscayne But as I started getting older Seems I saw my father less He and mom were always fighting at some point he'd had enough, I guess Heard the revving of the engine Very late one winter's night I looked out my bedroom window Watched those taillights fade from sight I didn't get a letter goodbye I didn't get a phone call, hello I didn't ask why, I'm not sure I even wanted to know Mom took a job on the switchboard at the Viking Hotel Managed to support us both till I was old enough to pitch in as well Still in all that time I never heard her speak about my father again But in her bottom dresser drawer there was a picture I saw Of him in our Chevy Biscayne I guess I can honestly say I don't think about him much anymore Someone said he passed away from a heart attack in 74 I'm married now myself and I've got kids ages 7 and 3 On Saturdays I take them into town in our new SUV But ain't it funny how a memory can keep on rattling around in your brain and every now and then I feel like I'm behind the wheel of our Chevy Biscayne. How it works. Pick one yellow pencil from the crowded bin. Untangle it from all of the others. Forget whether it's the thinnest pencil, the shiniest, or the smoothest, or even if it's the one with the longest, sharpest point. Stop wondering where it came from, or what other hands have held it, or how. Pick one. Free it from the fat black marker with the thick cap. Free it from the glib fountain pen the one whose sharp and shiny nib has usually gone missing. 
free it from flashy neon highlighters and silvery paper clips, from bookmarks with tattered edges, and last year's pocket calendars, the torn matchbooks with numbers scrawled inside, fading. Free it from the shrinking blue ballpoints with their nervously chewed ends. Pick at this one yellow pencil and hold it. Close your eyes. Pretend it's the only pencil you've ever held. Forget the others you could have chosen, the red, the brown, the one with the glittery gold-lettered logo. Slide a fingertip along its slick leaden point. Roll the beveled ridges of it back and forth slowly between your palms. Notice the wood warming. Take it firmly in your fingers, press point to page, and then bear down hard. Let it make its mark as it presses down deeper. And then whatever appears, whatever symbol, whatever mark, linger along the long, hard lines of it and those that are not. Trace its curves with your eyes, with your fingertips. Lean over, press your mouth down onto the engraved page. Lick your tongue along its grooves and indents. Stop wondering if any of it's perfect. Stop worrying if the smudge pink nub of an eraser will be able to truly erase. Hold this one yellow pencil and the dark, deep marks it makes, because this is how it works, what it was meant to do, and after all, this is exactly why you wanted it, because it's the one that you've chosen, or maybe it's the one that's chosen you, or maybe just because it's the one that's here, the one real thing you're holding in the palm of your hand. Beneath you the road is smoke, the bridges thunder, and everything is left far behind. Russia, where are you flying to? And this is for my son, and it's the third poem of the set, and it's called Being Watched Outside the Winter Palace. Sitting cross-legged on the ground by the bus, I decide I may as well barter too for a few packs of cigarettes, for a few American dollars everywhere we go, in the field, by our hotel, by the back canals, when we stop in small towns, I witness young Russian men trading black market watches as cheap as the candles we lit for the dead, or the few coins we parted with for penance. A young vendor pulls up his sleeve, extends his arm down to me, where the watches coil like a cobra tamed. Does that one run? Does this one need a battery? He pulls the watch off his arm. The watch goes from his hand into mine. Our fingers touch. In a moment, I see the watch in my hand and look up there in the space between the vendor and the clock tower beyond the approach of two gray uniforms. As they haul him a few yards away, the other vendors scatter into the crowds of Leningrad Square. The billy club snaps down and down and down on the young man's skull. The noise ricochets like shots off the portals of cathedrals. Half conscious, he keeps on fighting while my own body seems to be flying away from me. I think that boy will never fall. And I want him to fall, to fall quickly. Through an eternity he falls, he falls the way a leaf does. Finally his body touches the pavement, as softly as a kiss touches the closed mouth of an indifferent lover. His arms and legs flung out scrawl an X on the stones. Stomach up, he is all exposed to the sky the passers-by, and a young policeman who nods, half smiles over at us, over a silence 
into which any thick-toothed boot might stomp. Whether it's infectious disease, severe weather, or a chemical spill, emergencies that threaten our public health can happen at any time. After the events of 9-11, the federal government established the Medical Reserve Corps to respond to emergencies. Today in the Commonwealth, 45 Corps units recruit and train both medical and non-medical volunteers. In addition, the Department of Public Health's MSAR program, or Massachusetts System for Advanced Registration, credentials and deploys healthcare professionals to respond in such emergencies. Now a new effort is underway to enhance emergency response by aligning the activities of both groups. Mass Response is designed to facilitate emergency medical response and promote local partnerships in planning and assistance. And you, health professionals and concerned citizens alike, can be part of this important effort. For more information on Mass Response and how to get involved, visit maresponse.org.